All right, go to the book of Ezra, if you will. Good job with that, the book of Ezra. Ah, as you're turning there, uh, we started in Genesis. We're doing a book uh, a week, and we started in Genesis and went Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra. Now, Ezra... Ten chapters, ten amazing chapters in the scriptures. And we're going to start uh, this evening by reading verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to uh, switch back and go to two other verses in the Bible, and uh, you're going to try to compare these two verses with the other two verses that we'll look at in just a moment. So stand for the reading of God's Word, if you will. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And uh, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. If you're able, ready, let's read these. Now, wait a sec, I wasn't there. I was in the other one. (laughs) Don't get ahead of me now. Here we go. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now that was interesting right there. You notice uh, it began with Cyrus, the king of Persia, by the word of the Lord, and then it quoted from Jeremiah. It said, Jeremiah said some things were going to happen, basically. Now turn back to 2 Chronicles, the last chapter, chapter 36, and let's read those last two verses there in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23. And uh, let's look at this. Ready? Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him in the house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with you, and let him go up. Now, very similar verses right there. Second Chronicles and Ezra. Ezra seems to be the continuation of the book of Chronicles, and First and Second Chronicles right there, and it continues the journey. So much to learn. It's going to be an exciting night if you love the Bible. How many of you love the Bible? Amen. And you think about it. We uh, come here tonight because we love God. We love His Word. We know His Word is quick. It's powerful. It's life-changing, and we're a, a church that's centered on God's Word. The book of Ezra, I studied this. I was excited about it. You see all this danger showing you my notes right there. I have enough notes to preach 10 messages out of them tonight, and I'd be excited about it. And so I'm going to go from uh, first gear to second gear to third gear to fourth gear to fifth gear. And if you've ever seen a sixth gear, I'm going to pass that and go to seventh gear really quickly tonight. If you go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I'm excited. Uh, The Word of God, it speaks to our heart, Lord. It's you speaking to us. And Psalm chapter 1 tells us of the opportunity we have to delight in the law of the Lord. And that's why we're all here tonight. Uh, We're a group of people that delight in your Word. We hunger and thirst after righteousness. And when we do that, you God, you you tell us we'll be filled. And God, I pray that you fill us tonight with your Word with direction, with wisdom. Help us to have some understanding of this great book of Ezra, Lord. We need you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oh, an introduction. This is an interesting book of the Bible. Oh, I know you love it when old Pastor Nettesheim gets out his chart right here, and we're going to have fun with this. Uh, In order to understand Ezra, we've got to do a slight review. And a slight review is important for all of us, I believe. And uh, if you think about it, when we started in the Bible, uh, the book of Genesis, the big G right there, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's the the law, it's the the books of Moses right there. It takes us from creation 
Uh, it takes us to Adam and Eve, eventually to Noah, and then we get to Abraham, the patriarchs, Isaac, and then it tells us about Jacob, his 12 sons right there. It ends with Joseph and the coat of many colors being sold into bondage into slavery. Exodus uh, shows how God raised up Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. And uh, then we uh, get through Numbers, Deuteronomy. It speaks of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Oh, terrible. Then uh, the book of Joshua takes us an next step further. Moses dies. Joshua turns on the seeds and leads the children of Israel into the promised land. The promised land. The promised land. The glorious promised land. Uh, victories, but there were some defeats. Then after the book of Joshua, we had the judges. Remember the seven cycles of judges. Oh, uh, they're in despair. They call out to God. God saves them, gives them a deliverer, only for them to soon forget about God and go back into those vicious cycles uh, and seven cycles in the book of Judges. Ruth takes place during the period of the judges. Then 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, uh, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, begins that journey through the kings. Now, if we remember, the first king of Israel was King who? Oh, yes, King Saul. First king of Israel is King who? Saul. Okay, that's very good. Second king was King who? David. David, very good. None of you can see it over here, but that's okay. Then after that, we had King who? Saul. Solomon. Now, here's where the problems begin. Solomon and his sin. Uh, the kingdom became a divided kingdom. And I'll put here King Rehoboam and then King Jeroboam. And if you remember, uh, Rehoboam was the king of the south. He displeased uh, the Lord uh, by listening to the wisdom of the younger generation rather than the wise men. And uh, this uh, king of so Solomon, not to review here, but it's very important. Oh, this is dangerous. Please don't fall right here. Um, draw my Bible map right here. Uh, this right here would be the hmm, Black Sea. Here we go. Oh. Yeah, this would be the Red Sea. I'll just draw a body of water right here. Now, the Red Sea. All right, there we go. And then we go over here. This would be what we call the Arabian Gulf right here. The Tigris and Euphrates River come out of that. Then we go back to this. This is important for our lesson right here. We have this uh, is the Dead Sea. This right here is Sea of, Gal uh, sea of Galilee with the Jordan River running out of it. Right here is Jerusalem. Jay, right here. This south uh, right here would be the uh, southern kingdom of Judah. This right here would be the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, uh, we had all the kings of the north, what, were they good or bad? All the kings of the north were good or bad? Bad. They were bad, bad, and worser. Uh, kings of the south, some were good, some were bad. Praise the Lord for the Josiahs. Praise the Lord for the Hezekiahs. Uh, but God sent prophets along saying, get right with God or God will destroy you. Sure enough, God raised up the, uh, the nation of, of the Assyrians, capital city of Nineveh, that came down and they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. That blue probably looked like another river. Wasn't meant to right there. Ah. So the, the Assyrians... Uh, killed the northern kingdom of Israel. Then God sent prophets along. One of the prophets we'll look at tonight is the prophet Jeremiah. He prophesied that the southern kingdom wouldn't make it very much longer. He prophesied that there was going to be a 70-year captivity. And the nation of Babylon, capital city of Babylon right now, sure enough, they came down this way and they defeated the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, there is going to, as you see tonight, there were three uh, captivities or three uh, taking away of the people, three stages of captivity, three stages of captivity. The Babylonians took away the southern kingdom of Judah in three stages. In uh, 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, he first invaded the land and took away Jehoiakim and the leading nobles of the south, including Daniel. Jehoiakim would be the king of Judah at that period of time. The second stage in uh, just eight short years later was the second Babylonian invasion. This time they had took King Jehoiachin, he carried away into captivity, and then he took some of the most important people of the nation of Judah in the second phase of that, along with Ezekiel. Okay, got that? Ezekiel and uh, some of the ancestors of Mordecai. So they took them into captivity. The third one, there was another king of the southern kingdom of Judah right there named Zedekiah, 
and 686 B.C., it was the final destruction. 686 B.C. was the destruction of Israel. It's where the walls were broken down. It's where the temple was destroyed. Solomon's temple in all its grandeur was destroyed. And you have to understand, uh, these three stages of captivity were prophesied. The Babylonians took care of that, and it was prophesied. Now, I want you to look with me at the book of Jeremiah. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Now, look as you're doing this. You say, I didn't come here for all this tonight, Pastor. Well, I hope you came to learn the Bible. Amen. And so this is going to challenge you if you'll wake up for just a few short minutes right here. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. And uh, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. Okay, I was just making sure we're there. Here we go. The pressure's on. Jeremiah 25 verse 11. Look with me at this. It says, and this whole land shall be a, a desolation and an astonishment. Now, stop right this. This whole land. Look, 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 look. It's important for you to know this. This whole land is Judah. It's this nation right around there. This whole land, Judah, God's land, God's people shall be a what? Oh, it's a desolation and an astonishment. Keep on going in verse 11. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon... 70, are you there? 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of? And that nation saith the Lord for their iniquity and the land, and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it uh, perpetual desolations. So look at there. It said how many years? 70. Look, I'm putting 70 right there. 70. I'm going to put it again here. 70. That's an important uh, prophecy right there. Jeremiah prophesied the captivity is going to be for how long? Very good. Go to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Look at verse uh, 10 and 11 with me. By the way, get a Bible. There's a Bible in the pew right there. If you, you can sort of catch up, you'll, you'll need it. You'll want it and desire it when we get back to the book of Ezra. So look at this. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus saith the... That after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon's, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What a tremendous verse from the Bible. Uh, God has thoughts of peace toward his people. But he once again, he said, after 70 years, I haven't forgotten you. After 70 years, I will visit you. Uh, that's a glorious prophecy right there. Now go back to Ezra chapter 1. Now as you're going to Ezra chapter 1, remember the three stages, uh, the three stages of the, uh, oh, the three stages of the captivity. Uh, 605 B.C., uh, they took away Jehoiakim. Uh, 597 B.C., it was Jehoiachin. And then the stage three was Zedekiah, Ezekiel, and the rest of them. So uh, 70 years. The people are now, they've gone into captivity. They're in this land. Now, we'll read about that in the book of Daniel. Do you remember that, Daniel? Daniel, do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you remember uh, Daniel and the lion's den? Do you remember all of that? That, that was uh, Babylon in that area right there. That's part of the 70-year Babylonian captivity. We get to Ezra chapter 1. Look at with me at verse number 1 again. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, that, this is important. When you read your Bible, if you begin to start putting these pieces together, it helps you. We just had the Assyrians, Nineveh, conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. We then had the Babylonians become the world empire. Their capital of Babylon right there, they destroyed it. Now all of a sudden, after about 70 years, Persia, the Medes and the Persians, uh, they had Shushan as their capital, which would be over here. They conquered Babylon and began to expand their empire and expand their They became the world power. And so when we get to that right there, Cyrus, king of Persia, all of a sudden we know Babylon's gone. Hey, continue looking at this. Uh, now in the first year of, the, uh, of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of who? Jeremiah might be, might be fulfilled. Do you remember we just read those prophecies? 
Do you remember we just read those in two different places? We read that in Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah chapter 25. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy. It's interesting once again. Prophecy is simply history written in advance. When you have a, a prophet like Jeremiah begin to prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord, here's what's going to happen that we may give you an expected end. It's just history written in advance. You can count on it as happening. Though it hasn't been fulfilled, it's going to happen. It is powerful. It's wonderful. Here, all of a sudden, at the book of Ezra, things begin to happen. Seventy years is done. Cyrus begins to, to being raised up, the king of Persia. It's that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. God allowed this happen. God was in this thing. And God used uh, Cyrus. Now, we're, we're going to move on because uh, this is important to get through there. You understand there's a three stages of the captivity. You understand that? Okay, you all awake here. This is good. You look awake. You look excited. This is good. But then there's going to be three stages of return. Uh, the mouth of word, the prophet said that there's going to be a return back to the promised land. There's going to be a return back to God's land right there. The people are in dispersion. They're dispersed in the Babylonian region, just taken over by uh, the Persians right there. And there's three stages. In about 338 uh, B.C., Cyrus the, the Persian, he issued a decree that gave the Jews liberty to return to Jerusalem. And so uh, he gave them liberty not only to do that, but to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple that had been destroyed 70 years previously. And this re return was led by Zerubbabel, uh, and a small group, we'll see a little bit later, responded. So Zerubbabel and a small group returned. Then you go a little bit further. In three, uh, 458 B.C., a further group returned under the leadership of Ezra. Have you ever heard of the name Ezra? Hey, we're looking at the book of Ezra. So Ezra leads a return. And during this, this book tonight, we're going to study the book of Ezra. We're going to see uh, that he returned. Um, it was a whole generation later than Zerubbabel. Okay? And then we're going to go to stage three. And uh, you're going to see Nehemiah. He leads a return to Jerusalem. So here's the next thing I wanted you to get tonight. We're studying the book of Ezra. It's right after 2 Chronicles. We have the books... Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, okay? Say it again with me. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Those three books deal with the time period after the 70 years. So very, very, very. And not to get ahead of myself, but you get to the end of the New Old Testament. You have the book of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Two of those books, Zechariah, and Malachi, and those prophets are mentioned, not here, but in the Word of God in the book of Ezra. And those, those three prophets deal with after the 70 years, and they're in words of encouragement for God's people right here. So this is important, sort of an overview, because next week we'll go into the book of Esther, or ne Ezra, Nehemiah. Okay, next week will be Nehemiah. The last one will be Esther. I got it mixed up right there. But understand, we, this is foundational for your understanding of the book of Ezra. Are we there yet? Okay, so... We're going to go back a little bit. Um, I'm going to turn the page over here, and I want to explain some things to you. This is after the 70... Blah! Oh, go grab that. That would be great. Okay. Now, try to follow along with me. In 539 B.C., uh, Cyrus the Great encouraged the Jews to move back to their homeland. Okay? That's B.C. We'll put that B.C. right there. Uh, Cyrus. Cyrus. Got that? Then you're going to have in 538, Zerubbabel, he leads that first return. And so 538 B.C., Zerubbabel. Say Zerubbabel with me, the big Z. Okay, then um, you're going to get to the next part right here. And uh, in 536, uh, they start rebuilding the temple. There's going to be great joy. They get back. They get back to Jerusalem. They begin to rebuild. God begins to work miracles Ah, uh, and it begins to get the foundation. Some of the older people, as they're rejoicing, begin to weep uh, as they re rebuilt right there. Then you're going to see this group of Samaritans begin to say, can we help you? We want to help you. Can we help you? Zerubbabel looks at these unsaved heathens and says, absolutely not. And then all of a sudden, 
the Samaritans begin an all-out assault to stop the work of the rebuilding of the temple. And so uh, the work stops. They have the foundation laid for the temple. The work stops. Do you understand that? Then all of a sudden, God raises up a prophet named Haggai. Do you remember that? Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the last three books of the Old Testament right there. And, and the prophet Haggai will begin to say, hey, you dwell in your sealed houses. You've taken care of building your house, but you've forgotten the work of the Lord. You forgot the temple. And the amazing thought about it, you get in my head of myself a little bit, but, but God uses the man of God to rally the people about doing the right thing. And they got excited about rebuilding that. And they got excited and they rebuilt the temple, which they should have done. Holy mackerel, exciting. Uh, then uh, you get to 519 B.C. I forget writing these, but 519 B.C. Joshua the high priest is crowned uh, by the prophet Zechariah. Then, oh, 518, some of the delegation of Jews come down to Jerusalem from Bethel to ask the priests and the prophets if it was needful to still mourn about the destruction of the temple. And uh, Zechariah chapter 7 and 8 it fills in at that time. Zechariah the prophet uh, begins to comfort these people in Zechariah chapter 7 8 about their need or them mourning about the destruction of the temple. Then you fast forward 486, the Persian king Darius, he died. He had ruled the mightiest empire the world had no, ever known. King Darius is the king of Persia. Okay, got that? This seems maybe uh, so much to you overwhelming tonight. It's okay. You'll, you'll get this because we'll study this the next few weeks, okay? But it's, it's foundational. Then Xerxes, in 486 B.C., Xerxes becomes the king of Persia. Who is Xerxes, pastor? Well, Xerxes disposes of his wife named Vashti. Bing, 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 bing. Vashti, and all of a sudden, the story of Esther becomes important. Uh, that Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Xerxes, the king of the greatest empire in the world, marries a Jew, a Jew, and God spares the Jewish people in that amazing book. Then it continues on in 464, uh, Xerxes begins to rule the, the, an artist Xerxes begins to rule the empire right there. And then in five, 458, Ezra, the scribe, leads that uh, second journey back right there. Now, uh, go back with me to Ezra. We got that? I'm going to close this, and it's going to fall. No, it stayed up. We're going to move it right there. It's okay. Now go back to Ezra. We're going to go through these 10 chapters of Ezra, and uh, it's an exciting journey right here. Now, you're there, but look at this right here. Ezra chapters 1 through 6 speak of the return under Zerubbabel. Okay, so you've already learned that. But chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra speak of that return of, uh, of the Jews uh, under Zerubbabel. Then all of a sudden, uh, between chapters 6 and 7, six to six, there's a 58-year gap. Okay? 58-year gap. Sometimes when you're reading that, you don't notice that. But then when you start looking at it, chapters 7 through 10 speak of the return under Ezra. Those 58 years are important, by the way. The first six chapters, the return under Zerubbabel, the last uh, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, the last four chapters, the return under Ezra. Go with me. Chapters 1, if you will. You're there. Um, I want you to look at verse number 5. Chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Is that what I said? Okay. Then rose up the chief of the father of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Now, here in this right here, we're going to see that the, 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 the Cyrus, king of Persia, issued a decree to fulfill the word of the Lord. He says, go back, go back. God raised up uh, a small group, a small group, a revival of a few amount of people that actually did go back. You think about that. It's going to list in chapter 2, 35 family groups. And they were together with four groups of priests. There were some Levites who were led by Zerubbabel. In all, about 55,000 
Uh, and that may seem like a lot to you, but overall, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that were over there in the Babylonian land or the Persian land at that time, uh, just a small amount of people actually went back. And you begin to think about that, a very small remnant indeed, uh, when you consider the thousands. But, but why? Why did only 55,000 go back? Well, it was a long, hazardous journey. You think of that. It was a long ways. Uh, a, a journey's filled with difficulties, 700 miles. They had to travel 500, uh, five months long, and they had to basically start their lives completely from scratch. This seems small to you for a second, but it's important. Uh, it gives us a list of those names. It seemed like the Jews uh, liked the land of plenty more than the land of promise. Okay? Uh, they liked Babylon and Persia. It was a wealthy land, and it looked good to the majority of the liberal Jews. By the way, when I say revival of a few, chapters 1 and chapter 2 is a revival of few. Revival is disturbing. Revival is upsetting. Revival is life-changing. Perhaps that is why history records very few revivals. Because very few are, 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 will allow themselves to be disturbed, to be upset, to be changed in their life. Amen. And by the way, uh, when you look at that, there were those who were willing to go, and we praise God for that. And God devotes a whole chapter. Go to chapter 2, if you will. God de and by the way, the few that did go, God devoted a whole chapter to the names of them that responded to the call of God. And God would not let their names be forgotten, praise God. And you begin to look at this in chapter 2, verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon and came again into Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto a city. Verse 2, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah. And, and it continues to give the names, the names of the family. And I want to say one more time, God devotes a whole chapter to the names of the, them that responded to the call of God. God will not let their names pass. Amen. By the way, can I just say, I want to be a part of the few. Amen. I want to be a part of the few. Amen. How many want to be a part of the few? Amen. Boy, I want to go back. I want to go back. And this is interesting. You get to verse 65, and I just thought I'd throw this in. Uh, and it talked about how they gathered together and beside their servants and their maids of whom there were 7,337 and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Amen. By the way, men, you can sing, some of you, but I praise God for our singing men and women. I just want to say, I praise God in the Bible that had singing men and singing women. If the singing was just led to the men, we'd be in trouble. And praise God they had smart enough to allow the women to be involved in that thing. Amen? And I praise God for our choir of singing men and singing women. Okay, go to chapter 3, if you will. This is an interesting chapter. You're going to find that they begin to rebuild. And you'll, you'll see this. It was worshiping the Lord. They were working, and there's weeping in this chapter. In this chapter, we're going to think about three, three things. And look at verse 1. And the second part of it says, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Go to verse 2, latter part. It says, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So, look with me. Zerubbabel, come on! 55,000 or so, they're coming back, they get to Jerusalem, all of a sudden they're here. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to rebuild the uh, temple right here. But let's start by giving honor to where whom it's due. This is exciting. They begin with worshiping the Lord, giving the Lord honor and glory and praise. They didn't start with themselves. They started with God, the Lord. Now, go a little bit further, and uh, you, you look at this in uh, verse number 8. Go to verse number 8. Mm. Uh, it says, now, now in the second year of the coming unto the house of God, at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of the brethren, the priests, and the Levites. And it continues on, verse number 9, uh, to, it's the latter part says, says to set forward the workmen in the house of God. Verse 10, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple. Are you seeing this? In other words, they started praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord, but then began to work. They began to work. Okay, you don't like that word. They begin to work. And sometimes the work of the Lord is work. <laughs> sometimes the work of the Lord is labor. 
uh, they got busy working, praise the Lord. And uh, you get a little bit further, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple in verse 11, and they sang together by course in praise and giving thanks to the Lord. By the way, they were joyful as they worked. It wasn't so work intensive that they couldn't uh, have joy. By the way, the work of the Lord is meant to, to be joyful. It's meant to, to be uh, wonderful and glorious. And, and that's where our church should be. I think that's where our church is. We work, but it's wonderful work. Amen. Mm, it's interesting because... The next part is a place of weeping. Look at verse 12. I want you to read this portion to you. It says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was, uh, was heard afar off. And you begin to think about that. They laid the foundation, and they begin to see it was an emotional time of, of, of not only joy, but weeping. Not only weeping, but joy. And there's mixed emotions, because they could remember back to Solomon's temple and all its grandeur, some of them. Some of them had been there before and seen that. And you begin to see that they're beginning to get the foundation. It's not built yet, but they're thinking back to the splendor of it, the magnitude of it, all that they'd gone through. There's emotions there. Now, chapter 4, look at this, if you will. The revival runs into opposition. And uh, if you look here and start in verse 1, it says, Now when the, adversary, the adversaries, are, are adversaries good or bad? Okay, are they promoting the work or looking to hurt the work? Okay, so now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And, and, and we do sacrifice in them since the days of Esau, Hadan, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. But, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing, we have nothing to do with us to build a house uh, unto our God. But we ourselves together will build in the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. That is interesting, by the way. And we could devote a lot of time to this. But the adversaries, adversaries offered to help. By the way, Satan offered to help Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> right? And uh, the adversaries offered to help. By the way, this opposition is hard to detect and defeat sometimes. It's subtle. How do you turn down help from seemingly well-meaning and compassionate, uh, loving, caring, unsaved, unsanctified individuals? Mm. But listen, but nothing will stop a spiritual movement faster than accepting help from those who are not moved by the Spirit of the Almighty God. The Lord does not need the Lord's money, manpower, methods, mentality, or management. And praise God for Zerubbabel, who is wise enough to detect the danger of accepting this unsanctified, unholy, ungodly, unrighteous help. He also was at risk of offending, by the way, he was also at risk of offending those who wanted to do God's work without first getting into God's family. He was at risk of that. And as you see, he said, no. And guess what? Those people got offended and angry. Amen? Amen? But I want to just say, praise God, he said no. And, and we got to be careful sometimes. Uh, well, I want to help in the church house, but I don't want to join. I want to help in the church house, but I'm not willing to be saved or baptized. I want to be in the church house as a Sunday school teacher, but, but your beliefs on the King James Bible don't matter to me. And all of a sudden, a pastor has to say, no, 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 no. By the way, they may get offended sometimes. It's happened in the Bible. But praise God for a man of God, Zerubbabel, who said, no. And you little look at this in verse number four. Uh, the opposition begins an open attack. In verse number four, it says, Then the people of the, the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And it was an all-out battle, and you can read about that the rest of the chapter 4. Oh, it was a battle. And in reality, it did discourage the people. 
It did discourage the people, but I still praise God for Zerubbabel saying no. I praise God for him trusting the Almighty God. And, and let's go to chapter 5, because the work did stop. They didn't get much done. And the years begin to pass, uh, year after year after year after year. And we've we got to look at this. In chapter 5, verse number 1, um, it says, Then the prophets Haggai, uh, the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, do you hear that? The son of Ido prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Now, stop right here. Remember, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Right? Those are the prophets to the, after the 70 years. So two of those, Haggai and Zechariah, begin to preach to the people. They begin to preach. And I put this, praise God for good preaching. Amen. Praise God for good preaching. For good preaching moves people to get going for God. Amen. And you look at that verse 2. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of jo Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with, uh, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. <laughs> Those guys got a preaching and saying, Thus saith the Lord. Uh, and you could just see them all of a sudden uh, doing what we ought to do under good preaching, feeling the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And then rather than getting mad at Haggai and Zechariah, saying, Oh, woe is me. Forgive me, Lord. Let's get going and do right. Amen. That's what good preaching does. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Does it not? And we begin to think about that great truth. Haggai, you could read it in chapters 1, verse 38. He begins to uh, preach to them and try to encourage them. And then they begin to get the work done. Praise God for that. Uh, if you were to move on to chapter 6, I'm just going to say chapter 6 was victory. They built the house of the Lord. They built that temple. Woo! It says in chapter 6, verse 15, and this house was finished. In chapter 6, verse 22, it says, With joy, for the Lord had made them joyful. By the way, when you get right with God and you do what God wants you to do, it, He finished some things, and it brings you joy. It brings you joy. Now, stop real quick. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to make it. We're, it's going to be okay. We're, we're, we're close. We're close. Chapters 1 through 6, the return of Zerubbabel. Between chapters 6 and 7 is 58 years. Then we're going to look at chapter 7 to the end, which we're about to look at, is the return under Ezra. This is an important year. 58 years have passed between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Ezra, God's man. Look at, look at chapter 7, verse 1. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, ah, that's a hard word right there, but we see Ezra, verse 6. Look at verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon... And he was ready, uh, a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord God has got upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and of the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, uh, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the month, you, you get it, Ezra... It goes back, leads another group back to Jerusalem, back to the promised land. It's the second return after 58 years. Now, here's our memory verse. Verse number 10, chapter 7, verse number 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Say that with me. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. And Ezra was God's man. And it's, oh, not to get ahead of myself, but here's what you're going to see. Um, Ezra went back, and you can see that described there in chapter 7. You can see that Ezra took others with him. When you read that in chapter 8, it'll list some of the people that went back with him. Uh, but Ezra went back. He had a heart for God, a heart for God. And so chapter 7, Ezra decides to go back. He's called to go back and lead him. It shows us a group of people follow him. By the way, when a man of God or a, like a Sunday school teacher or a man, let's say or a woman in the home, says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. People follow him. Fathers, boys say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And people follow you. A Sunday school teacher, 
We're going to serve the Lord. People will follow you. And Ezra said, it doesn't matter. I'm leaving the, the ease that I have here in the region of Babylon. I'm going there. And a whole group followed him back to there. Now, here's the sad thing. Chapters 9 and 10 describe uh, a great mistake many of God's people do. Ezra, they lead uh, a group of people back from Babylon. Bum, 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 bum. Come on! Bum! We're here! We're here! We're here! Jerusalem. This time they do have the rebuilt temple, you know. And, uh, but they got problems there. It's been a long time, 58 years. There had been that generation of Zerubbabel on fire for God. Uh, there had been that generation who walked that five-month journey there, excited about the things of the Lord. But they had children, and those children had children. And it seems that somehow the children and the children's children didn't have the same fire and zeal as uh, Rubbable and the people before him. And here, Ezra walks into a situation not on fire for God, not where they should be spiritually, and here's where we're getting at. I want you to read chapter 9, verse 1 with me. Look at this. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites. By the way, stop right there. The people of Israel, that's God's people, right? God's people, just nod with me. God's people, okay. The priests, those are... You know, God's main servants who take care of the temple, right? Those are, oh, okay. And the Levites, that's God's, that family that's supposed to be taking care of the priest stuff, right? Oh, boy. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites, and the Parasites. Well, they weren't there. Verse 2. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Now stop right there. We're almost done, but we can't pass this point up. A great mistake, a, not a small mistake, but a great mistake many of God's people do. A great mistake. Well, it's a little thing. Well, it may seem little at the beginning, but that little thing at the beginning turns out to be a big thing in the end. And what's that? Christians, well, okay. Back then, there was a trap that the Jewish people fell into. And you begin to think about that. They had revival. They had great men of the past, Haggai and Zacharias. Uh, things had changed. They, they, uh, they arrived. Uh, God's blessing, the temple is made. There is joy. Uh, we've arrived. Uh, we've arrived. They begin to be spoiled. They begin to be lazy. They begin to be worldly. It ended up being a place where God's people married the world's people. They listened to the world's music. They listened and, uh, to the world's entertainment, the abominations. They dressed like the world's. They had the priorities of the world. Rather than being separated from the world, they were following the world. That's well, just a little thing. Okay, is it? Well, Ezra got back there and it sure wasn't. And you begin to think about that. Um, it's not much different than today. Uh, marriage. You mean, pastor, that I should have an influence on who my child marries? Yes. Amen. That's old-fashioned. I'm not going to let them do... Uh, I'm going to let them do what they want to do because that's what they want to do. And who am I to tell my kids what to, to do in that marriage thing? Well, that's what happened back then. And parents in Christian nations and Christian churches should have an influence on who the young people marry. It's right and godly. Amen? Amen. Amen. We go a little bit of this. Uh, you, 
you get this a little in trouble, Pastor. Uh, th they could say, the devil's music, and, uh, you know, it's, what's the big deal? The devil's music. Well, it's in most of the churches today, and that's what everybody's doing, and everybody's marrying the, he the Hittites or the Amorites woman anyways, or their kids anyways. What's the big deal? What well, is a big deal? Amen. Uh, entertainment. What would have been considered terrible uh, entertainment was no big deal to them now. You know, everybody's doing it. Everybody watches Star Wars. Now, Christians not too long ago preaching in Star Wars. Let the force be with you. Well, what force? What force? Hey, come on, pastor. That's old-fashioned. Well, you wait till your children grow up. You wait. And you need a, uh, somebody like an Ezra who stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord. And warns you about that wicked thing. Otherwise, your children are going to be married the Amorites, the Hittites, and all of that. Amen. And it, it's serious now. Yeah. Dress. Now, here's the one that always gets the pad. What, what, <laughs> what the world would have been shocked at just a few years ago is common. And not only common, but justified by a majority of Christians. Now, I wouldn't say this. But, for example, could you imagine if a preacher did say something like this, okay? Just imagine, for some, not me saying this, but just imagine a preacher saying this, okay? Because I don't want you mad at me because I'm not going to say this. I'm going to uh, quote some phony preacher out there that might say something like this. Can you imagine if a preacher got up today and said uh, in the pulpit that pants were meant uh, as a man's, man's garment and not meant for a woman to wear? I could almost hear a cringe in the reaction from the congregation. How dare he say that? He's just behind the times. And by the way, that, that I may, say, may think of that happening right there, but there's no difference back then. The majority of the people got so far away from the Almighty God that they couldn't see right from left. They couldn't see spiritual from unspiritual. They got to the point where their children were married, and it was a mess. That's what Ezra, Ezra came back to. He came back to a mess of a situation. And Ezra came back, and wow, uh, look at this. You think it's a, well, ha, 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 ha. Look at verse 3. And when I heard this thing, Ezra heard this thing, I rent my garments, my garment, and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. In other words, it was not a laughing matter. It made him sick. It made him sad. It made him tired. The worldliness of God's people, God's priests, the Levites. Got him so uh, upset that it, it hurt him physically. And, and you go on a little bit further in this chapter. We're going to be close, but, but look at this real quick. You can read the intricacies of this. It gets to chapter 10, verse 1. Now, when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel, uh, and I praise God for this, a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Now stop, look at me. We're going to be done. Ezra came back over here. He was told, hey, we got some problems. Ezra looked and he said, oh my, what has happened? He rent his, his garments, he rent his mantle, he fell down, he wept, he prayed, he confessed, he was, he was sad. And all of a sudden, he'll begin to gather the congregation around him. The congregation praised God instead of ridiculing Ezra, instead of criticizing him, instead of kicking him back, say, go back to Babylon, we don't want you. Boy, they begin to wept too. They begin to get right with God. And that nation, praise God, praise God, begin to gather around and get right with the Lord. It's a powerful truth right here. In today's world, a preacher gets up, and not in our church, you guys are different, but a majority of churches today, a pastor won't get up and tell what's true. Amen. He's scared to. That's right. Yeah. Because he'll lose his job, he'll uh -huh. lose his security. He that's has right. no freedom to say, thus saith the Lord. Come on. That's right. And that's why they change their music. That's why they change their dress. That's why they change every aspect. And in, a, in the end, they don't please God. They please the world. They please the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, and all of them. Yeah. But they don't please the Almighty God. Right. The point being tonight, more than anything, is not all those little things that I talked about. The little thing is about having a heart for the Almighty God. Where sin, we begin to weep at it. Sin, we begin to cringe at it, and we begin to say, "Not it doesn't matter what I want. I want. I want. I went screaming out a little bit, but that's the way we live. That's why it got to the point, I want an Amorite's daughter. 
but it didn't please the Almighty God. Ezra is an amazing book. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you.